Unibet. Episode 71. Phil Pritchard, Keeper of the Stanley Cup. It's kind of like at the top of the pyramid in sport because, because it's the same trophy year in, year out. In a lot of the other sports, they have their own traditions, and those are great, and they all work for them, but they make a new trophy every year. In hockey, they preserve their history so well, not just at the NHL level, at every level. History of the game is so important in hockey. Die Tribüne erhebt sich. Und der Hexenkessel kocht. Da bleibt kein Moment, um einmal durchzuatmen. Bring it on. Mit dem Torkender! Und die Scheibe im Tor aus dem Nichts. Wie schön war das gemacht. Unibet Hockey O'Clock. This indeed is a very special episode of Unibet Hockey O'Clock. And I never thought I'd be able to do this. And I never thought that this person would be sitting in, in front of me or opposite me. Obviously, the, the recording space is an interesting one because we're doing this in a broom closet. But opposite of me is none other than one of the keepers of the cup. Yes, the cup, the Stanley Cup. It's for Pritchard and Phil. I'm so happy, so grateful that you're taking the time for the show tonight. Oh, Martin, it's great. I, I know when you first approached me about we're going to go into a broom closet, I didn't know what was going to happen. So it's pretty exciting. We're, we're thrilled to be here in Austria. Obviously, the Stanley Cup is a, is a big part of, uh, of every hockey fan's dream. And, and to be here in Vienna, it, it's a special day. If someone has never heard of the Keeper of the Cup, what's a Keeper of the Cup doing? Well, I, I think in the essence of, of what we do with hockey, we all work at the Hockey Hall of Fame and Museum in Toronto. And as curators there, we look after the collection, which contains, in, the, in our world, it's hockey artifacts. So it's jerseys and helmets and sticks and trophies. And hockey trophies are so unique compared to other sports because they're the same ones all the time. The greatest trophy of all, obviously, is the Stanley Cup. And there's only it's one of a kind. It's 130 years old. But it's, it's almost got a life of its own. And as the keeper of the cup, our, our job is to be a historical figure for it, to be a promotional figure public relations, security at some times. We conserve and preserve it in that. Uh, it's, a, it's probably the pinnacle of, of sports, of what you want to win in sports, and it's, it's the National Hockey League's greatest gift to the world. I want to talk about a lot of things. Obviously, the, the myth that, that's been created around the trophy, but I want to start with your quote-unquote other job, the curator of the Hockey Hall of Fame. Now, if... if People have never been to Toronto that should be on the, on the bucket list. What's there to see in a Hockey Hall of Fame? And, and how many different, different kind of wings do you curate? Well, I, I think you're, you're, it's very flattering that if you do come to Toronto and you come to the Hockey Hall of Fame, uh, hockey in Canada has basically grown up together. So if you're coming to Canada, you should see some hockey things. And the Hockey Hall of Fame and Museum is a big part of that. But... For my guest experience to come through to see the, the early roots of the game of hockey, uh, how the National Hockey League was formed, uh, the history of the Olympics and hockey, international world championships, the European leagues. We, we preserve and promote all leagues, all levels worldwide. There's 96 countries in the world now that are playing the game of ice hockey. You don't have to be a cold nation. Uh, they can make ice anywhere. But... Everyone that puts on a pair of skates, plays, plays hockey, wants to play in the greatest league in the world, the National Hockey League, and come to North America. But at the Hall, we promote the game of hockey as a whole, not just the NHL, not just the Olympics, not just international, it's hockey as a whole. So as a curatorial staff, we are, we are trying to tell the story to the guest, so the guest experience is, is an ultimate one, and they go out of there they didn't come in as a hockey fan, we hope they leave as a hockey fan. What's your favorite exhibition or what's your favorite piece of, of hockey history in the Hockey Hall of Fame? Is there even one? Are there a couple? Yeah, it, it's so hard to narrow down because for me, I love the jerseys of the international nations because they wear their, their flag or their, 
country's colors on the front and obviously their name on the back. And our collection of uh, international jerseys of, from world championships, I think we have 77 of them now from different countries that have played in world championships over the year. To me, th- those are extra special. I also love the, uh, the Stanley Cup vaults that tells the history of what the Stanley Cup is, who Lord Stanley was, why he gifted this trophy to this game, and what it represents to not only players, but fans and coaches and that as well. It's, it's a great question. It's a tough one to narrow down to one or two, because to me, I think come and see the whole Hockey Hall of Fame is a, is a treat in itself. Now, there are constantly new sports that evolve. We, we've had esports for, for the past couple of 10 years, and no one ever saw that competitive gaming w- would ever be a thing. Hockey's been around for quite some time, but for, for all the sports, past, present, and future, how important is it to have something like the hall? How important is it to cherish everything about the game, past and present? Well, I, I think what all museums represent is the past, And you're only as good as your past, whether it was favorable or, or people made mistakes and have improved like it on it. It shows what our, our present is and will hopefully guide you into the future. So to me, museums are, are very important in education and that, and especially the Hockey Hall of Fame from our side of the game on how the game has grown over the years, what it's coming to now, and 10 years from now, how much it will grow because the game is being played worldwide now. It's, uh, I think it's a very exciting time to be a hockey player and a hockey fan, and we try and showcase that at the Hockey Hall of Fame. It's the Stanley Cup that was gifted by Lord Stanley of Preston. How did that all come about? Well, what, what's amazing, the whole story of the Stanley Cup, is the Lord Stanley side of things. And he was the uh, sixth Governor General of Canada. So what he did, he represented Canada back to Great Britain. So... The royalty appointed the uh, governor general who looked over our country. And when he came to Canada, he was a, a sportsman and got involved in Canadian sports. But he had six kids and three of them got really into hockey, two boys and a girl. And when your dad's the governor general of a country, you got a bit of pull with good old dad. And the kids said, dad, we're playing hockey and they don't have anything to win. What can we do? He had this idea and he went back to London, England and found this little fruit pole, if you want to call it that, that was made in Sheffield, England in the 1850s. He branded it his and he brought it back to Canada. The story goes, the rest is history usually, but in this case, the history happens every year. So yeah, the rest is history, but there's a new chapter of the Stanley Cup story that happens every year. And we, as curators at the museum, we try and preserve that and promote that. And, and I don't think there's any sport that does it better than hockey on preserving their past to tell their present and future. The cup has a very distinct silhouette. It, it started out as a, a fruit bowl, but at some point bands got added and, and several of them because each and every cup winning team gets their players, coaches, executives engraved. When did that start? Well, it's, it's amazing you ask that, Martin, too, because it did start off as a, as a little bowl. And I don't think Lord Stanley ever thought the cup would be 130 years old or anything. He, he donated the bowl as a gift to the Canadian people to play hockey for. It took off so fast because the game of hockey began to grow so fast. And by 1907, the team that won, the, the Montreal Wanderers, they thought, What a great idea. Why don't we engrave our name on the inside of the bowl? So they did that. And then the 1906 team in 1905 said, hey, we won, but we didn't put our name on. So they started doing it and started working backwards. And all of a sudden they ran out of space on this little bowl. What are we going to do? So they started adding a ring and teams put it down there. And then they ran out again and they kept doing that. And it got into this, this shape that we have now that it is a unique shape in that, but it's It's a one-of-a-kind shape, and only the Stanley Cup can pull that shape off. But everyone that has won looks back up into their history because their heroes are on it and their heroes are on it, and that's what makes it so beautiful. Now, there are several layers, there are several bands 
tied onto it. One band has space for 13 cup winning teams. Now, a lot of people back home don't know what happens if one band is full. Right. And, and what is special about that is obviously the cup can't keep growing and growing. It's, it's just over 90 centimeters now and just under 16 kilograms. So it's getting big. But in, in 1992, 93, there was, a, there was a great story that the cup was getting full and what do we do to continue this tradition? And Brian Trache, who at the time had won the Stanley Cup six times, said it's the perfect height to hold over your head. And when you think of that sentence, how do you keep it that way? So we thought, well, if we take one ring off, preserve it in the Hockey Hall of Fame, and then add a new ring to the bottom, it will always evolve. It will always change, but it'll always be the same. So that look that we were talking about earlier will always be there. And I think that's what makes it special, that we're, we're preserving the past by removing a ring, putting it in the Hockey Hall of Fame, and then adding a new ring so the history is still all there, but it's evolving. Where is this trophy myth coming from? Why is it the holy grail, not of hockey, but probably team sports? Yeah, and it is. It's, it's kind of like at the top of the pyramid in sport because, because it's the same trophy year in, year out. In a lot of the other sports, they have their own traditions, and those are great, and they all work for them, but they make a new trophy every year. In hockey, they preserve their history so well, not just at the NHL level, at every level. History of the game is so important in hockey, and it, it's for uh, younger kids to understand, older kids to appreciate, and even down the road as we go on, that the game is preserved and the, and the history continues to go on and, and things like that. So I think that's what really separates the Stanley Cup from other trophies. Because the interesting thing is if, we, if you look at other North American sports, the NFL got its Lombardi, but it's more about the Super Bowl than it is about the Lombardi. No one knows the, the, the Larry O'Brien trophy really in, in the NBA and, and, and even less of people over here know what you can win after after winning the, the majors in, in in baseball. Yeah. But if you if you really break it down, if you really narrow it down, each and every kid, each and every adult kind of knows the Stanley Cup. At what point do you think did you, did the National Hockey League try to to ride on that wave of that cup myth? Well it, it, it I mean you some great examples there of the NFL and NBA in that and, and those trophies are beautiful. And we see them up close. It, it's got the whole story of what it represents, but it's a new trophy every year. And it, I think what hockey has always done is preserve their past. And it's whether it's the names of divisions, the team names, the logos on them, they've kept that all the same. And, and why not keep the trophy the same way as well? And if you ask a Stanley Cup champion what it means to them, they remember when they were a kid, their hero won it and how they thought then. And now they become a hero for someone else. So not only are they becoming a champion, but they're, they're becoming a hero for someone, a youth of today, which becomes the player of tomorrow. The cup is so, so important for the National Hockey League as well as, as their whole brand goes. It's called it's the National Football League playoffs, it's the NBA playoffs, but it's the Stanley Cup playoffs. When did the league really start picking up on it and, and, and using it like for all the logos, for all the brand management? Well, I, I think what's amazing about the Stanley Cup is it, it's bigger than the game itself. Because whether you're a youngster in Austria or a youngster in Canada or southern U.S., you, you play hockey, you, want, you dream of playing in the National Hockey League. You'd love to win, and the ultimate dream is hoisting that Stanley Cup over your head. So although you play in the greatest league in the world, you're playing for a Stanley Cup, which is almost bigger than the game itself. And, and through the NHL's vision and everything, that gives them that opportunity to take the Cup back home. It shows how the magnitude of what the Stanley Cup is. The Cup is a traveling trophy. Now, a lot of people don't know all the intricacies with, with the Cup, but what happens after a team has won the Stanley Cup, which usually happens in June? Right. Well, it's amazing as, as you sit here talking to a curator of a museum 
and we have a, our, probably one of our greatest artifacts, which is the Stanley Cup, but it's also a traveling trophy. And most museums will say, you shouldn't take them out of the museum. That's, that's an artifact. Let's get this Van Gogh and, and yes. show it to people uh, yes, on exactly. square. And that's what hockey does. And hockey does it better than any sport. They, they let you share it. It's almost the people's cup, if you want to call it that. So what happens each year, the, the Stanley Cup is won, and usually sometime in June. And then the team gets 100 days to celebrate with it. Years ago, Commissioner Bettman, the trustees of the Stanley Cup, the NHL, the Hockey Hall of Fame got together. And we understood that the game or the team is much more than those guys on the ice. It's the spouses. It's the grandparents. It's the coaches. It's the teachers. It's the neighbor that used to take Billy to practice to tie his skates because mom and dad might have been away or something. So that team grows over the summer. And by giving the guys a chance to take the cup home to thank them, it not in not only shows the love for the game and the respect these guys have for other people, but it also shows how big this Stanley Cup is and, and how it goes back to it's much bigger than just the guys on the ice. I want to get to that, that day with the cup and everything that goes, goes into it in, in a bit. But as it is a traveling trophy, how many days of the year on, on average, if you could put an estimate on it, spends or does the Stanley Cup spend on the road? Probably, I'm going to say 10 months, pretty close to it on the road. Uh, and obviously we talked about the 100 days that the team wins. We do a lot of promotional things like we're doing here. We do a lot of charity events to raise awareness for sports. And uh, we do a lot of hockey fights, cancer things to help the unfortunate. So there's all these different events. There's partner events and all of that that all add up because... As we talk about the Stanley Cup, it, it's, it's almost bigger than the game itself. And, and that's what people want to see. You, you see someone that has no knowledge of the game of hockey, but they see this silver 90-centimeter trophy there, and it, you just kind of have to attract towards it. You go towards it. And I, I think that's because 10 months of the year it's on the road. Getting into the business of being a keeper of the cup, you've been doing it for more than three decades. If there's a person out there who thinks, well, I want to become a keeper of the cup, how does one do it? Well, I mean, it'd be great if my wife was here right now because she'd probably tell you a different story. Uh, I, I think I was in the right time at the right spot. I, I always wanted to win the Stanley Cup. And like everyone else that's put on skates or picked up a stick, you want to play in the NHL and you want to win the Stanley Cup. I, too, wanted to do that. But I realized pretty young that that wasn't going to happen. I didn't have the skills. My face got in the way of the puck too many times. It, it just wasn't going right. And I thought going into college, I still want to be involved with hockey. I want to be involved with sports, just like many of us do. So we follow that path. And... As all of us do that are in sport, it's, it's a tough path because everybody wants to be in that. So you, you have to volunteer your time. You have to dedicate hours to it. You have to do the things you want to do to get to a spot that you love. And, and I'm happy to say, probably like yourself, that we have the greatest job in the world because we love what we do. We get up in the morning. We're thrilled about it. We're excited. We get to meet new people. We have lots going on. And that's what makes it so special. So to be the keeper of the cup, I guess, when I move on and someone else is going to take it over, I think, I think passion, I think respect, I think tradition, those are three big things that you have to keep in mind if, if that's the way you plan to go. Now, if people back home are listening to this episode of Unibet Hockey Clock and they go like, man, 10 months per year on the road, <laughs> how does he still have a wife? For the record, and we have to give credit where credit is due, there is a second keeper of, of the cup. It's how, it's how we borrow. How is that, that relationship between you two going? Well, you know what? I mean, and, and we do have a, every now and then, we have a couple other guys that travel as well. So I do get to have be home. I got a great wife. I got a great family. And the time we get to spend at home, it, it, I cherish it in that. But I also cherish the time that I get to spend on the road and and hear people's stories and share stories and that. And it, it, it's so special. 
Uh, Howie and I have kind of worked together now for probably 12, 13 years now. A couple of the other guys are a bit longer in that too. And But I think that's what makes it so special is we love what we do. And as we were talking about earlier, people that are in sport love what they do. And you see it in the way they they express themselves. They, you see it in their passion, in their eyes. You see it when they share stories. And that, to me, that's what makes it all special. The Cup is usually awarded in non-pandemic years, nothing that we've ever seen uh, recently in June. But at what point does the keeper of the Cup go on, on high alert? Is it with the first elimination game in the Stanley Cup finals or are you starting to plan, plan your trips when... when the Western and Eastern Conference uh, finals are set. How does one to have to envision that? Well, I, I would love to say we could plan things out, but as we all know in sport, anything can happen. You, you think the series is going to go one way and, and it goes another way. But as we hit the playoffs, we know we are down to 16 teams and then it goes down to eight and four and that. And by the time we get to the fourth team, you kind of have an idea of, you know, you got 25% guess of where you, you might end up. Uh, the Cup during that time is doing a partner tour with the media and that as well in North America with the remaining 16 and then eight and four teams. So we are, we are traveling at that time. But once we get to the final and it gets down to game four and there's a possibility of it being won, it, it's, it's really exciting. And not only for, for ourselves, obviously for the players of both teams, the fans of both cities and, and everyone else listening around the world, it's It's an exciting time in sport, the Stanley Cup final. And it's obviously been a, been a setup question because once you know where to go, it's a whole different matter of eventually getting there. Were you ever close or did you ever kind of get stuck in traffic? Was it ever close for the Cup not making it to, to the venue where it should, should have been handed over? Well, you know what? I mean, obviously, when, when we talk about getting to events and that, things happen sometimes in that. And Mother Nature can play havoc on us sometimes. Uh, we've always got there. It's been always special in that. When you talk to the uh, the players after they've got presented the cup and how excited they are, you can see it, hear it in their uh, eyes and mind. Of we we waited two minutes, or I waited five minutes, and then at the end they go, "Well, I've waited my whole lifetime." So whatever that is, that makes it special. Is a keeper of the cup allowed to, to share sympathies with certain players, organizations, stories? And, and I and, and, and a lot of hockey fans so vividly remember Ray Bork finally getting his cup. Now, obviously, the other team just would have liked to win the cup as much as the Avalanche in, in 01. Yeah. But heading into that game seven against the Devils, what went through your head? Well, you know what? I mean, you, you hit it right on the head that there's there's history happening and all the time. And when Joe Sackick passed it to Ray Bork, it was so special. As every hockey fan know, Ray grew up playing in Boston his whole career. And he, he wanted that chance to get closer to the cup. And he, he took a chance on going to Colorado. There's no guarantees he's going to win there. Boston could have won for all he knew, but it, it worked out. But you really got to credit hockey players because they understand that you could see it when Joe Sackick immediately before he even hoisted it handed it to Ray Bork because Joe had had the opportunity to raise it already but Ray had never touched it and to see that I mean and that's what makes I think sport so special because as athletes people realize that everyone has a milestone to get to or a dream to get to or a certain level to get to and they want to help one another on the way it, it, it was a magical moment to be standing on the ice and to see that happen and it, it's it's a highlight for me for sure speaking of touching the cup you've become kind of iconic and connected to to the cup also because there are always white gloves on your hand what's it with the white gloves well we go back to our opening conversation here when we talk about hockey hall of fame curators Every curator at every museum in the world wears white gloves. And the reason we wear them, obviously we all have oils on our fingerprints. We don't want to get them on artifacts. Uh, we all respect the artifacts, whether it's an artwork or whether it's a hockey stick or whether it's a painting, what it, whatever it might be. But in the late or early 90s, we brought those white gloves from behind the scenes 
and we brought them out because we have always felt the cup should be handled with respect. So behind the scenes, we'd always hit carry it with white gloves. And then all of a sudden it made it onto the TV and it became, called it kind of almost a cultural icon immediately that if you see me, I have to have white gloves on. And it's, we do it because we respect what the game represents and respect what the trophy represents to the game. How many pairs of white gloves are you running through every year? You know what, Martin? I have every pair I've ever worn. I keep, keep them in my house. The keeper of the cup is the keeper of the gloves? Correct, yes. So, as all of us, we have drawers for our pants and shirts and underwear and socks. Well, I have a glove drawer and I have every pair going. So, they're all in a bag with labels on them and that. And maybe that's the museum side of me as well. I don't know what I'm going to do with them one day, but I, I just thought I'm, I'm going to keep them. You know, so I, I've done it. You know, there's someone out there who, who, whose attention has now risen a little, and, and if there's ever an auction, <laughs> <laughs> you can. <laughs> I don't know if that probably is. make a fortune out of it. But this is also kind of the purpose of of, of the podcast, and I'm so glad that that, that you're that you're doing this because we're we're sharing or you're sharing your incredibly vast knowledge about, about the cup and, and we're educating people here on Unibet Hockey O'Clock. Once the cup's been handed over, I imagine the tough part of the year starts for you because I just think there, there's going an incredible amount of, of scheduling into it, getting getting those 100 days of the cup planned. How, how does this process work? Well, you know what, you, you say the incredibly hard part of it is the incredibly exciting part of it too because the emotions are high and everyone is so excited and they want to take the cup and they all have these ideas. I want to go back to my hometown and meet my first hockey coach and that. And you're listening to this and you're trying to put in your head, how are we going to accomplish all of this? And we basically take a world map and sit with the coach and the GM or their team personnel guys and kind of map out where everybody's from, make sure that the guys are going back to their hometown because some guys will go to their spouse's hometown or wherever they grew up playing hockey or something. And then we, the next part is we, we work with the, everybody to find out what dates don't work. We don't ask them what days do work. We have to ask them what days don't work because some guys are going on holiday or in wedding parties or what have you, maybe have a, a newborn coming into their future or something. And then from there, we know where we can go and how. We try and do it geographically. So if we come to Europe, we try and do all the Europeans in one go, if we can. Uh, if we cross Canada, we try and go west to east or east to west or vice versa. Same with the U.S. And, and try and make it go from there. Every day is so emotional, so powerful. Your, your summer seems to fly by because you're at, celebrations all the time but every one of those celebrations is part of that chapter of that year you hear it in in, in hockey broadcasting and and outlets that cover hockey all the time that it's an international game now with your and it's getting even more international with your experience from 34 years is that indeed the case i i believe it is i i think what a lot of people don't realize is hockey's been playing around the world since the 1920s i mean it's It's been playing in all different countries. Arguably, it's most popular in Canada, but you look at a lot of these winter country sports or winter sports that, from the countries, and they all love the game. And you're beginning to see it grow and grow. But I, I think statistically in the NHL now, I think 30%, which is almost one out of every three players, is from Europe. So that, when you put that in the big picture of a global game, that is pretty impressive. I don't know what else, what other sport, if there's any, that is that high. Uh, European football has a lot of Europeans and, and Africans and South, South Americans. But I don't know if it's 30%. Like, that's, that's a big number. And it's a special number, and it's a number that's going to grow because NHL wants the best. How many countries has the Cup been to? Uh, 30 countries now, which is To me, absolutely amazing. When I started in 1988, if I would have thought we've taken the cup to 30 countries in just over 30 years, that shows you how special this game is to everybody around the world. 
And this could be growing. We just had the very first Australian player debut in a National Hockey League. Ever been to Australia? Not as of yet. Uh, apparently, they're, they're coming on. They're, they've got uh, Nathan Walker, who, who grew up in Australia, actually, but was born in Wales, plays. And then, as you mentioned, the most recent uh, firstborn Australian. But I, I think as we talk about it, hockey's played in 96 countries. So why not have 96 countries represented in the NHL? That'd be, that'd be a dream. Now, after you know where you're going to go, it might not hurt to know what it's going to be. What was the, the strangest or weirdest wish a player, a coach, or an executive brought forward? So I'm going to start by saying to, they start off as strange, but when you hear their reasoning, all of a sudden it's not so strange anymore. And it sounds judgmental, it's but actually, it shouldn't be. Yes, you're it's so right. And that's probably the perfect way word is judgmental. Because what someone might do in Eastern Canada, they would not do in Europe. Because it's just a different way of life and they think differently. I remember Philip Grubauer of uh, the Washington Capitals, born in uh, the Bavarian Mountains outside of Munich. And Rosenheim. Germany. Yeah. And uh, so he grew up in the mountains, and that's where he had his day, but he wanted to climb up the mountain. I, he wanted a mountain climb with the Stanley Cup. So when you think of it from a Canadian point of view or a North American point of view, going, what are you, really? He wanted to have breakfast at the top of the mountain. And when we got there, and he shows the passion of where he lives and where we're going to, It's no longer strange. It's no longer weird. It's now exciting because you're going to the top of the Bavarian mountains to have a German breakfast with a Stanley Cup champion and the Stanley Cup is hiking up a mountain. And to me, to see his expression when we got to the top, looking over his country, hoisting the cup there, that's, that's what it's all about. So all of these weird, different, unique, things they want to do and I should say that everything they do is respect they they will not do anything that is disrespectful to the game of hockey to their nation to their club team to the Stanley Cup it's it's respect 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 as we're rounding out this this conversation our good friends at Unibet have provided me with some up-to-date odds as regards the Stanley Cup playoffs the Colorado Avalanche are favored by one of five to win the cup, followed by the Florida Panthers, one of seven, the Calgary Flames, one to 8.5, Carolina, one to 9.5, and Tampa Bay, one to 9.5, fourth three Pete. If you had to, in the back of your head, narrow it down to, to, to five places, would those five places where you think the cup might get awarded correspond with those five mentioned here? They're on there. All five of them are on there. And I, I think what's amazing, and, and as you follow the fan base or you follow the, the betting line, there, there looks to be some favorites right now. And, you, and we mentioned about Colorado and Florida and Carolina and Tampa for a three-peat in Calgary. But as we know, all know in sport, once playoffs happen, anything can happen. So although they might be favorites... Once they start the opening puck or face-off in the Stanley Cup playoffs, you got to win 16 games. And you have to have an injury-free team. You've got to have luck. You've got to have skill. You've got to have everything going your way. So, but yeah, those teams you just listed off, they're, they're in my favorite. And you all have to do that after having just gone through a gauntlet of 82 regular season games just to get to the final dance. But because of the fact that some of the recent cup handovers happen in cities and with organizations that had never won the cup, the Blues, one of the, the, the longest running teams that had never had a shot at the cup and, and finally got over the hump, the, the Capitals, is it more rewarding to, to hand over the trophy to a team that has never won? Or is it all the more rewarding as goes excellence in the sports to hand it over to the Lightning a second time? Well, you know, I, I think the key word there is rewarding because you're not only handing it over to the team, you're handing it over to the fans too. And to see a 
a team that has never won the Stanley Cup before win it. The players, the fans, all of them know they've achieved what, what it started out as. So that's always special. But to, to see a team like Tampa that could be three-peat or, or Pittsburgh that could win their sixth cup during their uh, career, teams like that, it, it's amazing for the fans too because they've, they've achieved it, but they, they want it back again. If, if that's allowed, like, is that greed? I don't, I don't think it's greed. I think it's just, it's the, the natural psyche in a fan. So to me, whatever team wins is great. For the fans, it's super special, and I'm so excited that it's coming up to Stanley Cup playoff time. Same here, and those can be watched on Pulse24. I've got one um, last or maybe next to last question, depending on your answer. If a team has won it, and if you go through the coaches and the players, are you and Howie kind of kind of drawing up a list? Who gets to spend the, 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 the day with the Cup with, with whom? Because I'd imagine, haven't seen what... Alexander Ovechkin did with the cup after he finally won it. My hand would have would have gone up when when someone would ask who wants to spend a day with the cup and Alexander Ovechkin. How, how did that work with you guys? Yeah, I, and you know what? I mean, we always try and, and be fair on that on doing that. It's it's a long summer as we talked about. It's an exciting summer, so we we try and break it up where we can. Uh, the opportunity to see someone ex, as excited as Alex Ovechkin was. And to share his excitement that he he brought on to us too that we were so excited for it is, is always special. Maybe I can flip it back to you. Let's say Martin wins the Stanley Cup. What are you doing with it? Probably bringing it back home like most of them do. Yeah, it'd be pretty special, right? Bring it to your family, your friends, your coaches, your schoolmates. And that's what all these guys do. And they're thinking the same thing as you and I are thinking. If you had to put a percentage on it, how many people do spend it at home and, and how many people really go for something that hasn't been there? Well, you've men mentioned the, the breakfast in the Bavarian Alps, something out of the ordinary. It, it was out of the ordinary, but then again, we haven't had a lot of players that were born in the Bavarian mountains play in the National Hockey League. And as, as we see this game grow, there might be a lot of other out of the ordinary. But I think if you ask every player they all want to take it home and share it with their family and friends because they know that they're part of the team. They're not the team on the ice, but the team that makes the team on the ice. I want to indeed round this out with a question you're probably going to hate me for, but it has to be asked. You've been around the cup for 34 years. You've created hundreds and thousands of, of unique memories. But if you had to, to single one of them out, where you say, okay, this is the one that will stick with me forever. This is the one that, that even when you're six feet under, that's the first one that comes to you, to, to, <laughs> to you first. What would that be? Uh, well, And you're allowed to hate me. Okay, I'm going to buy time for a second because I think every summer when, the new, when a new Stanley Cup winner is announced and we walk out the red carpet, that is so exciting to me because it's a new chapter in the Stanley Cup, so we get to meet some new people and we get to share stories and hear their thoughts and their dreams and all that. So that's always exciting to me. But there, there are, obviously there are stories that stick out. I, I remember being in uh, Nevada once. This is way before Las Vegas had a team. We were there for a, a golf invitational tournament that had athletes at it. And we were in Lake Tahoe of all places. It's not a hockey area but they got great golf courses. So there was football players, soccer players, you know, baseball, basketball, hockey players. And we had the Stanley Cup on display. Patrick Waugh, who had won it with Colorado, brought it to that because he got invited. And we had it on display. And I guess there's a group of people in Lake Tahoe that swim in Lake Tahoe every day. So I'm standing by the cup and people are getting photos with it. And some lady comes up to me and asks me if I've got a coffee cup. I said, I, I don't. I said, maybe the clubhouse does. She goes, we have a, a urn full of coffee right there. Why don't you have a cup? I said, well, that's not a coffee urn. That's the Stanley Cup. And she didn't know what it was. But what was amazing about it, and she did get her coffee. She had to go inside to get her cup. But she came out and she started talking to people. And I think that day maybe we created a new hockey fan. 
So if the Stanley Cup can do that every day, we got the greatest sport in the world. And for all you know, the National Hockey League returned to Lake Tahoe to have games there. Yeah, maybe because of that. One, indeed, very last question, and and this this rounds it all out. And I've asked asked you you before about it, so now you had a little little time to think about it. When thinking of the cup and thinking of the the thousands of people that that have been handed the cup over, how many grown men have you made cry in your life? Well, I, I'm gonna preface it first by saying not just grown men, grown women too, because it's so special when a player wins it and their mom and dad share with that. You see the power, you see powerful emotions there. You see not only the, the player crying or the, the mom and dad crying, but the sister or brother or grandparents and that. And that's just from the player's side. But the fans that, like the St. Louis Blues fans that waited over 50 years to see the Cup won in St. Louis, they went to game six, they lost in St. Louis and they thought, What's going to happen? They go to Boston and they win it and they come back in the middle of the night and there's thousands of people at the airport. People have got old blue shirts on, they're crying. It's pretty cool to be part of. To put a number down on that, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's fair to even guess a number. It's a pretty powerful trophy that brings pretty powerful emotions. Nothing better to round this out. Hockey Hall of Fame curator and keeper of the Cup, Phil Pritchard. So thankful that he took the time for hey, you. Hey, it was great, clock. great chatting. Unibet. Exzellente Unterhaltung mit dem schönsten Sport der Welt. Unibet. Hockey. Okay. 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 Okay.